everybody to Pod Meets World. I am Danielle Fischel, aka Topanga Lawrence. And I am Ryder Strong, aka Sean Hunter. And I am Will Friedle, aka Eric Matthews. How you guys doing? You ready to ready to jump into the uh, pilot? Uh, <laughs> yeah. This was this was uh, an interesting experience. Um it, it's funny though, like I don't know how you guys feel, but I definitely remember the pilot. Well, actually, this is probably a different... Di well, obviously, Danielle, you weren't in the pilot, so it's a whole different thing. But I shot the pilot two different times. Yeah. Um, and so we did it before you were cast, Will, and there was a different dad. So and in any case, the, the pilot, I actually remember more than probably any other episode. So it was very bizarre to know lines. Like I could actually like hear lines and be like, oh my gosh, I, I, have, I remember that. But then also completely not understand like what the show was about because I was still just very much a kid in the midst of a show. You know, I had, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, well, let me, great. let me tell everybody exactly what the pilot episode was. It was season one, episode one, uh, otherwise known as one Oh one. Um, and it was called the pilot. Uh, it first aired September 24th, 1993. And uh, the episode is that Corey is caught listening to the Phillies game in class while Mr. Feeney is trying to teach the class about love. So they're talking about Romeo and Juliet, and he is listening to the Phillies game in headphones. Uh, Eric decides to take his girlfriend on their very first date to the Phillies game instead of Corey. Oh. So Corey is furious and thinks that love is ruining his life, and he decides to live in his treehouse. And um, that was my watch hitting the <laughs> desk very angrily. Um, Passionate. He, he lives in his treehouse that happens to overlook the backyard of their neighbor. And Side yard. Si Oh, this is a huge debate. Oh my We're already God. jumping in. So a couple oh years ago, God. there was a kerfuffle online as to whether it's a side yard or a backyard. Side yard or the backyard. We'll I honest, it. Okay, we will get into it then. Um, <laughs> so he, he Corey's treehouse overlooks the backyard of yard. Mr. Feeney's backyard because, very important to the show, Mr. Feeney is Corey's next door neighbor. And womp womp. Uh, and so, yeah, Will, how did you feel watching the pilot? Um, okay, so it, it made me very, very anxious to go back into the world. I don't know why. I have no re I no reason that can pop up in my head immediately as to why I was so anxious pressing pressing play, but I was. Um, and then as I got into the episode, I realized one of the reasons why I didn't want to watch it, and it's because I am the worst um and it's not and again it's not you i'm used not to say being, well, you used to say to me you'd be like i didn't learn how to act until the second season dude i said that and i believed it but this was you weren't bad dude no it it you're not. i thought you were awful. worse because you've been saying this since we were yeah since we were oh. like 20 you've been like oh, oh i didn't learn how to act but They're, i watched oh. it i was like no will's great it's no it was t i was by far the worst actor for the entire episode. <laughs> Lily, everybody was nailing their jokes. I was laughing out loud at certain points. And then I would come on the screen. It was like, A, what am I doing with my hands? Which I had no, it was like, I will, I will walk this way because I was told to walk this way. And then it was like, say, oh, I will get into it. It you was You had no character to, to be fair. Like Eric But was I just could have invented of... something. You had I... four lines and were the by far, a writer, I'm saying this, you were by far the best actor on the episode. Yes, you that is true. You were by far was... the best actor on the episode. And I'm including I... the adults. Maybe Bill, because Bill was Bill oh. and you knew what Bill was going to get and he was oh. brilliant. You you guys are crazy. I was like, what am I doing? I, I, I look but so you were awkward. But you were, all, that's the thing is you were already Sean. Like you right. had that the character was already there. You could tell there was some angst. You had you were the <laughs> only one who was natural in your line readings, especially in the cafeteria scenes. Yep. Like Sean was already there. And then there was the rest of the show. And that's, it was like, it was weird. That's funny because I guess in a lot of ways, Sean was an easy like, I mean, I, you know, Sean was, was, it was so easy to not be Corey. Do you know what I mean? Like right, Corey right, right. is so defined and he's so anxious and he's so like just outwardly freaked out about everything that to have his best friend be like reserved and kind of cool. Yeah. And, like, like it was an easy, like he was such a good foil. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, he was an 11 year old stand up yeah. comic. Right. Right. It's, that's what it was. That's what I realized when I was watching it. It was like, oh, the show is about an 11 year old stand up trying to go to school. Right. 
Which right. is what it seemed like to me, like all, like he was doing bits the whole time. Totally, and he does this thing that uh, that was so funny, like I to not to to realize now, he you know he has that like, uh, and this is a classic Michael Jacobs creator of the show. This is a classic thing that he does as a writer and as in in person too, where he sort of has a character just state exactly the obvious with so much cynicism. You're like, well, I just hate everybody all the time. You know, and like having an 11 year old say that was so funny. Like, it's so cute. Right. And it's like, I just realized like, oh, that like Ben, I always thought that that was something like, well here in, in general, I was amazed at how much of the show, what Boy Meets World became was already there. I was yeah. blown away by how much was encoded into the pilot because I truly believed in my head after all these years that the show developed and changed and became this thing, which it did. I mean, it definitely grew, but you could see the heart was there in the pilot. And that was truly, uh, I did not expect that. I really thought that the pilot was going to be like, what is the show? And instead I was like, oh no, it was all there. Like yeah. the, there was so much of the show was there. Yeah, I thought there were so many... L First of all, I'm not in the pilot. Uh, I I do not appear until episode four. So I truthfully don't remember. I'm assuming I did watch it when the show aired in, in 93 because I probably sat with my family to watch the show that I knew I was going to be on, but I don't have really a memory of watching the pilot. Um, but I was amazed at how much... like all of the different layers. Like now when you watch a pilot, it's very much, let's just meet the characters. But this, the storyline of Corey is learning about love in school because of Romeo and Juliet. And then love impacts his own life inside his family's home because he's going to a baseball game that he's very excited about with his older brother. And then he gets ditched by his older brother. So now love means you know, something bad to him, then he gets reminded that he once ditched somebody he loved, that as he got older, he may have ditched his father. He learns about that. And then he sees Mr. Feeney possibly get ditched and hurt by love. And then in the end, he realizes he could have a different uh, impact on his sister's relationship to what love means. Like that is, and that's so many different layers of, yeah. of, deep storyline for one a kid show and two a pilot right yeah and, and a pilot in which not that much actually happens i mean it's not like he no. runs away and joins a circus he goes to the backyard sits <laughs> in his treehouse but it has such emotional stakes and i guess that's what i mean is that the tone of the show the 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 seriousness of it you know like there's a period where there's not a laugh for like a good 10, 12 minutes where yeah. you know mr feeney and Corey have that scene in detention that is just pure wonderful writing and acting. I mean, Bill is so good. He's a I genius. I could not believe how amazing Bill Daniels is in the show. And you He's just realize that was the defining character. And I, I you know, this is, I, we have to tell this story, which is that um, the pilot, when we shot the pilot, when you guys weren't there, we did a table read and the network hated it. And the network immediately made Michael rewrite it and Bill Daniels said, I'm not doing this kid's show and threatened to quit. And Michael Jacobs rewrote the pilot from start to finish. It was a completely different script. I would love to get my hands on it. It still involved Romeo and Juliet, but it did not have any of this other stuff. And Michael Jacobs, this, the lore is that he wrote it in one night. I, I think that might be true. Rewrote the entire pilot only keeping certain j jokes and certain themes, the Romeo and Juliet, but what they delivered the next day was essentially what, what is this pilot. And it's, I think it's really really good. And I was blown it away is. by Bill's performance and his commitment and the tonal shifts, the fact that it starts off as this sort of Dennis the Menace oh, the you know, that wily kid and the grumpy teacher. And then it, it goes somewhere else. It goes somewhere truly deep and meaningful. It explores all those relationships. Like you said, the dad, the mom, the sister, the brother, and the original pitch for the show, which everyone kind of forgets, was what would it be like if the if instead of following the older brother on growing pains, yeah. they followed the middle brother? Yeah, it was growing pains. If it was the middle, the, the middle brother because yeah, growing lead. pains was a hit show, and Michael yep. Jacobs was a, a, a you know a, a, an established television creator. They wanted to create a show for Ben Savage, so they partnered Ben and Michael, and Michael then went to the network to create a show for Ben um, with his partner at the time, April Kelly. Um, and the two of them came up with the show, which was let's instead of doing the typical thing that's on television. Right 
right now, which is focusing on the older brother and a family of younger kids. Let's focus on the middle kid who gets lost. And that's exactly what the pilot is, right? He gets lost between his relationships with his teacher, who also happens to be his neighbor. He gets lost with his relationship with his dad, his sister. He's in between. He's in that. St- and it's such a great place for a character to, to sort of have to work out from. It, one of the things that amazed me when I was watching it was the genius that is Forget Bill Daniels' performance, which is next level. Uh, yes. Next level. It's ridiculous. But the genius of having such a well written teacher to where you can teach on a show. I mean, it, meaning it, all the shows that you watch, especially kids shows, it was like the dad would impart a lesson or the mom would impart a lesson or one of his friends, he'd learn something like that we Boy Meets World literally had a teacher who yeah. could take the, the the lessons that he's teaching in school and teach them so you could apply them to life. And it's, it had never been done like that. It was always yeah. The teacher was always the buffoon. Yeah, the was teacher was the to crazy guy. Of it. Yeah, no, it, it was amazing. This, it sets this structure up that I think existed throughout Boy Meets World, but certainly in the early years, where you can... You can deliver abstract ideas, abstract lessons. Like very, in the mouth of Feeney, you can have things very declaratively stated. Love means this. Sometimes this happens in life. Whatever the sort of you know declarative abstract concept, and then you have that intention with Corey's messy life or all of our messy lives, and and that's just a great structure for a sitcom, right? Because it allows you to sort of make a thesis statement. <laughs> like this is the episode about love and all its permutations, and Mr. Feeney's going to always be. Right. And, and it's it's very so almost biblical in a sense. Right. It's like you have this like abstract uh, testament idea of like, this is the lesson. This is the rule about life. And Mr. Feeney can sort of say it. And then you have just like these little sketches of scenes where Corey's going, none of this makes sense. What are yeah. you talking about? How do I relate love to my brother and love to my little sister and love? To, and he does. And that's just. And you, you as the audience are inside of that process and you're able to enjoy Corey, but you're also able to sort of record in the back of your mind like, oh, yeah, like there's 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 something more important going on here that I need to think about. It, it also showed, though, I thought it is very strange because it also sh- again, we, we should talk about this a little bit. So there was an original pilot that was shot without myself, without William Russ. They recast a couple people. Alan then, uh, William Russ is Rusty Russ. Is Rusty Russ who, who, who plays, plays Alan Matthews. Alan Matthews. And yeah. Matt McCoy was the original dad. I'll never forget that. And a Harry, I'm going to do this name? This poor man uh, 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 an injustice. I, I want to say Branishy or Branchy was That's his right, name. That's right, something like that. Um, yeah. A fine actor. Just We've talked about this in several things where I he was recast because he just wasn't tall enough. That's all it was. He was literally the same size as Ben already. They knew Ben was going to grow and they wanted somebody yeah. to be when the older brother. When you're a kid brother. actor, they are always concerned with how tall you how are tall you are. Because Height. if you outgrow yep. the people that are supposed to be older than you or you get taller than the adults, it ruins. It because does. you're usually playing younger than yourself. I remember at one of our conventions, I ran into... Uh, a, 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 a fellow child actor growing up and they were like, why did we all turn out so short? And I'm like, because being short when you're a child actor is such a benefit because yeah. you can be 10 years old and play eight or seven. Yeah. You can yeah. be older and play younger. So you end up casting short people, shorter kids. And yeah, anyway, go on. So yeah, so, so that's yeah. what happened. They re, they recast. And so we, the pilot, if memory serves, reshooting the pilot was actually for me, episode two. Because the first thing that we did was, was the episode, episode two, one, I guess. Well, no, one. Yeah, one uh, w- w- was, which will be the next episode we watch, was actually the first episode that I ever shot. Right. So going back to the pilot, the the pilot wasn't even my audition scene. Like my audition scene was from that first episode. So going back and shooting it again was was very strange, I know, for you guys, because you're like, oh, we've done this already. And then it was like, well, we've got to go back and, and shoot the first episode second uh, to get everything kind of on the on the line. But they also kind of saw where some of the show was going to go, because if memory serves, Lee Norris is in the opening title credits, but he's not in the episode. Yeah, well, we had banked probably three or four episodes before anything aired. So, so he was a regular the, yeah. and was in the opening title sequence, which we can talk about the wonderful opening title sequence. Yes, uh, let's please. Because... <laughs> well, should we start with the cold open? Should we just get ready? Yeah, yes. Get, yes. Okay, right, let's so start with the cold, cold open. Cold open is Corey Feeney. 
uh, and me and uh, Chauncey Leopardi. Yep. <laughs> who was the other best friend at the time in the pilot. Originally, Corey was supposed to have two best friends. Chauncey Leopardi, you guys might remember from The Sandlot. And um, what else? He was also... He did um, a bunch. Yeah, he ended up working a lot, but uh, it didn't end up staying on our show. I think he was originally supposed to be another regular best friend. And then throughout the first season, we'll, we'll talk about this, we kept replacing... Uh, the the other best friend. We went through several. Yeah, it was going to um, yeah. be Corey and his two best friends. Right. right. And Ryder was one of those best friends. And then there was like a rotating third friend. Yeah. Well, so let's we, just say it. Michael just kept firing all the kids that that were. I mean, but it's true. I mean, if we're going to be talking about it, we called it the death chair, the chair yeah. that Chauncey is sitting in there. And it was every kid they brought in. Some of them didn't even make it to yeah. the, we've we've talked about this in the, the first episode we did. Didn't even make it to the, the second yeah. run. Through. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah, not technically the death chair because we rearranged. I think in the next episode, it'll the cafeteria changes. We, yes. we set Does the it? tables okay. in a different formation and then that became the death chair. It did. OK, just yeah. whoever sat in the chair was yeah, gone. We'll, we'll keep, that, a, keep an eye on the death chair. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. So it's a simple, simple little scene. We introduce Corey and Mr. Feeney, who like their characters are immediately well established. I thought, you know, it's just so fun. I also just was astounded at how um, direct everybody is with each other. <laughs> like Mr. Yeah. Feeney's just mean. Corey's That's just a brat. I was like, oh, we're, we're going bold strokes, like right out the gate. And then that opening credit sequence, it is so dated. Oh, my God. Bam, 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 bam. It's bonkers. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry. You want to talk about dated before we even get to that? Can we talk about how the big joke was a Steve Lawrence joke? Wait, yeah. what? I didn't Steve, even get that. Exactly. I wrote that so down. Big, I was like, I don't know what this is. The suck so, up joke? No, no, no. Steve Lawrence was, a, he, he was a, a, he would come on and do like these Stephen Edie kind of things. And he was always late night. They would bring him on. And it was like, so the, the, Build up of the joke between these three eleven year olds who stayed up the latest, right? Oh, who stayed up the latest, and yeah. it's like, and when you so you've got an eleven year old throwing out a Steve Lawrence joke, and everyone going Steve Lawrence, <laughs> it's it, it, I don't think I knew that reference at the going, time. By the way, yeah, of so course, that's me acting because I have no clue what I'm saying. Nobody did, nor did <laughs> anybody who watched the show. I will guarantee you, there was not a kid in America that went, they nailed that Steve Lawrence joke. <laughs> Like, that never happened because it was just the most random, like, are you kidding me? Okay. They're doing a Steve Lawrence joke. But then joke. during the opening credits, which that song, uh, let's talk Ugh. about, so Ray Colcord did the music for Boy Meets World all seven years. He Great died guy. a couple of years ago. Re May he rest in peace was just the sweetest, nicest yeah. man. And so Such talented. Such a genius. So he was talented. a genius. Yeah. He could do yeah. any type of music you wanted him to. He, they would bring him on and be like, well, we're doing a rock and roll show. This And he'd like immediately just write, an, yep. uh, write a song. 1940s song. Yeah. Okay, okay, it was there incredible. You go. Yep. Uh, but that, that theme song, it's so long. And it just keeps <laughs> going and going through all these like transitions. And like, I just couldn't believe it. And then there's like literally a rollerblade like coming in and smacking Corey in the head. And it's like, what is happening? He pulls off the band aid like he's got to take colors, the band aid. Yeah. The color. Yeah. It's like you could not. If you if you hired a creative now to be like, go make the most 90s opening credits you can, they would pick that color palette, those outfits, and those computer graphics. Oh, it's, yeah. And the worst. Well, so it was also fun. the start of obviously with with it being called Boy Meets World. It was the start of us doing every photo shoot and every everything holding a globe. Oh, <laughs> we were always throwing a globe. Always here's your world. Like all right, here we go. But I I distinctly remember two things about the opening title sequence. I remember lying on the, they're like, oh, we're gonna shoot the opening title sequence now. I thought they'd pull stuff from the show. They didn't. They're like, all right, just lie on the bed and flip through a magazine, but look up at us as you're doing it. Oh, the classic and I was sitcom like, look so up. So why am I why am I flipping through and I was, I, th this is, you know, my first episode ever, so I'm not asking any questions. I'm like, that makes sense. Okay, got it. Sure. Um, so I'm not looking at the magazine as I'm flipping through it. <laughs> and then the other thing I remember is Betsy. Betsy was so funny. She did that. Betsy that, Randall who played Betsy the Randall played <laughs> played uh, Amy Matthews. Amy Matthews. She um finished it and we when we all got together to watch the pilot i think we all got together to watch the pilot maybe we really? some episode where we all got together to watch and she looked at me right as her scene she puts the band-aid on his head and she gives him this look as she walks away and she turns to me and in such a hollywood way she goes that's my please watch our show look 
<laughs> and it was just the way she said it was so cool because she was. If you look at it, she gives this big smile and she's like, oh, Corey, like this big kind of please watch our show. And it was just every time I watch that opening title sequence, it's so funny. You're like throwing the paper the airplane, paper airplane yeah. and... There was only two lines in the script describing Sean. You know, you don't really get much character description, in the, but it was the thin, sly best friend of Corey. That's kind of all we had to go on. <laughs> but, you know, like I said earlier, being, you know, being being any sort of savvy or like calm in the face of Ben Savage's Corey oh. just instantly created a character. But I do remember they wanted me to be a troublemaker. That was like early on discussed. So like, yeah, when they gave, they gave me a, a, a paper airplane and said, just throw it like you're gonna hit somebody and get away with it so that's my getting away with it so wow. when when did you guys meet verse and and how long was it between the first time you met and filming the pilot we all now know as the pilot i remember the exact moment i, I met the you right moment i met you too yeah. oh my gosh okay writer you go first <laughs> let me hear from your pov oh uh, should we turn off will uh, will's headphones so, uh, <laughs> yeah take it off. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um so uh we met in the uh at, at a photo shoot for the season every season they would have a photo shoot where they'd gather the regular cast together and get that season set of photos they do individual photos and the whole cast together and we had already shot the pilot it was now the show had been picked up for 13 episodes which was half a season and they brought us you know we all were supposed to meet and we were in the makeup hair room of the um of the uh uh, uh photo oh, shoot yeah. yeah and just immediately will and i started talking and did not shut up um it was like <laughs> i remember we talked music we talked counting crows day one <laughs> Most nineties thing ever. We talked because you were you were really into them, and I had just discovered them. We talked. Um, we talked about we were both living at the Oakwoods. I remember yep. immediately knowing that we were going to be neighbors and friends. And I mean, I just you were older. You were the coolest, coolest kid I had ever met. <laughs> coolest person. You had your own car. What was yeah. it? It was a red. I still have it. A nineteen eighty six Celica GTS. I still oh have that God. same car. And then you had a subwoofer in it. Yep. Uh, and I think like week one, not day one, but like week one, you brought me in and played uh, Paul's Boutique. No, uh, Paul, Paul Revere Paul by Revere. Beastie Boys. Yes, Beastie yep. Boys. Yes. <laughs> Paul Revere by Beastie Boys, which has this crazy bass sound that goes boom, boom, boom. And it just like blew my ears out. And we were sitting in the car and I was just like, if I could ever be 16, have a car and a subwoofer and be as cool as Will Friedle, Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. You were the best, dude. Were I did. I remember that exact. I was. See, I'll never forget it. I was sitting in the makeup chair. I was so excited to be there. I turned to my left, and there are. So I had met Ben at the audition. So Ben came to the screen test, and the screen test was between myself, your brother, older brother Shiloh, mm -hmm. and Jason Marsden, who is still one of my best friends to this day, and be and played Jason Marsden on the show. So I had met Ben before, but there you were. I turn. I'm. I'll, I can. I can picture it. I can picture what I'm wearing. I'm in jeans and the shirt that I pass the poster every day. It's hanging on my wall. I got the tie dye shirt on. Remember? Yep. <laughs> yes, you have the tie dye shirt on, and I turn and you. I'm turning my left. And there you are, and we started the first conversation. I'm still sitting in the chair, and the thing that scared me the most about that day is I just met Rusty. I just met everybody for the first time. You and I got along instantly, and then they're like, all right, we're going to put you all together for pictures, and they put us all together, and I put my arm up around Bill Daniels, Mr. Feeney, and he turned to me and he went, don't touch Feeney, and I really <laughs> shot my hand back down. Perfect. And I was like, oh. so perfect. now all the, of the pictures. The perfect bill. That it was bill. amazing. The pictures Which is that, so convoluted it, because it's like, does, did he, was he in character? I was have no trying, idea. I mean, because he's not wrong. Like, don't, no. you shouldn't have your arm around feeding. You were trying to just be like friendly pose for a we're picture. We're taking a picture. He's hey. not wrong. But it's also so classic bill to just be kind of grumpy. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> don't touch Feeney. Don't and touch Just Feeny. like that. And oh. every single picture that they have now, my hands are in my pockets. And I am like, I'm not touching anyone ever again. I it was it was amazing that first photo shoot day. Oh. Yeah, that was that was our our intro to each other and to the world. And it was yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. Wait, so, writer, did Shiloh audition to play Eric? Yeah, he screwed yeah. us. No, actually, he ended up not doing the network test. So Shiloh, the reason I got Boy Meets World was because Shiloh had, had tested for, or the reason I was first brought in to audition for Boy Meets World was because my, my older brother Shiloh, he's only 18 months older than me, than me so we, we always kind of went out for similar parts, or we were not that 
far apart. He had network tested for Michael Jacobs' previous show called Almost Home. Almost Home. Didn't get the part, but Michael Between really... myself, Shiloh, yeah. and Jason Marsden there for that go. role. So, yeah. so, so because of Shiloh's association, I got brought in to, to audition for Boy Meets World. I ended up getting the part. Meanwhile, Shiloh went off and did a pilot on another network with... Ed Dector and John Strauss, who became writers on our show, yes. they had created a show called Odd Man Out, which also got rebooted five yeah. years later. Whatever, that's a whole other story. But my brother was the star of his own pilot, and that show did not get picked up. And when you're a kid actor and you're you're in you're in demand, all the shows pounce. Like if you're if your contract didn't get picked up, so Shiloh got asked to come in and audition for Eric. He never actually did it. They asked him to screen test for Eric, or he got offered a show on NBC where called The Mommies, where he could just be one of the sons on The Mommies, the older teenage son. And he looked at the equation, you know, my parents, and we were all like, this is crazy. Like, Ryder's going to be on this TV show. Do we want Shiloh to audition to be on the same TV show? And it was like, no, you, you, you just take the offer on this other show. But of course, that made our lives incredibly complicated because that meant my mom had to shuttle between two different sets. <laughs> so, yeah, so he ended up not auditioning. I'm not sure if they brought in a third person or if it just ended up being you and Jason, Will. But Shiloh did no, not it do ended the network up test. Finally being the, 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 the I think he... So I met him the first time because it was the three of us reading oh, for did? Almost Home. Okay, so, oh, yeah, so yeah. maybe okay, so maybe he. You know, I don't know if he actually. No, no, for no. For almost, this just, is for Almost Home. For Almost I'm Home, for okay, almost home gotcha. we did that, and then it was I. It was then between Jason and I because Shiloh. We heard had Shiloh had dropped out, quote unquote, yeah. Yeah. of going to Boy Meets World. But again, it was down. We, we you talked before about how small a world it is. It was down to the three of us twice in a row, yeah. and Jason got uh, got Boy Meets or Jason got Almost Home, and then I got Boy Meets World. Um, and, uh, and Shiloh was doing the mommies. So and all Shiloh three was of doing you. the mommies. So yeah, yeah. so it was it, it worked out. But I uh, was with my dad in in Los Angeles, and I did not think I got the part. It was a terrible read. Ben was there. Ben came in and read with us. I was awful. And my dad said, "Well, what do you want to do, kiddo? You know, like you, it's what what do you want?" And I went. I remember the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Hollywood. And I was like, I want to go to the Rip. He's like, all right, fine. So we went there. And uh, until about 10 years ago, it was actually there across the street from the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum. There was a bank of uh, what was called um, uh, pay phones, kids, where you actually had to put in money <laughs> and dial a number. And uh, somebody else, uh, KL54000, appeared on the other. How can I connect your call, sir? Appeared on the other side. <laughs> And um, I called my agent and my dad said, just call your agent and tell him you didn't get it. And we're going back home. And I called my agent and said, you got it. It's been picked up. You've got to you've got to move to L.A. And my dad and I ran through the Ripley's Beauty Not Museum and then went and found the Oakwood because I had to live in L.A. like two weeks later or something ridiculous like that. And that was wow. 30 years ago. So it happened very quickly once it happened. And then you're at the photo shoot and then you're friends with Ryder and then you've got this going on, and then you're in front of the audience and it's just, it's, then you're going. It's so, so the strange. photo shoot happened before you guys ever even had a rehearsal day. Yeah. 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 It was like a week before or the week of, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So and then I by the time you get to rehearsal and you're starting this, this pilot episode, are mm -hmm. you guys already feeling like friends and family? Like it's already, you've already started a bond. I mean, Will and I definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember Ben and I did not start a bond. Ben was really into sports mm -hmm. and I was not. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember like a lot of the first early episodes, he, you know, he he wanted to like play basketball like with the other kids. And, and there were always other kids because you had extras too. Um, but but so I remember during the pilot and but also Ben was working a lot. Because uh, yeah. he was in so many, you watch this pilot, he's in so many, he's in every scene. Yeah. And that's a lot for a kid. So he would be gone. He was sort of distanced, you know, like, and and yeah, like I said, he was very much in his own world. He was very, um, I remember him be, just working and being busy and needing to learn his lines and also going to school. And he was sort of at that point, Hollywood royalty for us, you know, like, I because his brother's show had been such a hit. He was also the, the person who like knew what we were doing more than any of us. Um, and so, yo, no, I didn't really connect with Man, I would say until like episode four or five, did we start really getting to know each other? I think in part because I was just one of these other kids, you know, like yeah. I wasn't part of the family. I think, Will, you probably connected with Ben because you were part of at the time the show, you know, it, was, it wasn't supposed to be a school show. It was supposed no. to be a family show. And so the priority was given to the, the, the show, you know, the, the, the parents and you, Will and Lily. And so that was sort of more the like core group. I was like an outsider. It was like me and Chauncey. Leah Party, who's then gone. And then like, you know, whoever else they brought in that week that could potentially stay. 
But yeah, so it was really, I was just lucky to have Will. Like, I know we bonded right away. And then I loved school. Like, I loved, I already loved school and I loved my studio teacher immediately. David Combs. David Shout Combs. out to David Combs. Yep. Yes, yep. David Combs. And he had been brought on because he had taught Fred Savage on, on Boy Meets, I mean, on uh, Wonder Years. So they brought him on and um, just a genius spoke five languages, could teach yeah. any subject. He was uh, a personal and, oh, tutor to the, the kids of the Shah of Iran. Remember yes. that? He yeah. was a very eccentric, interesting yes. dude. Yeah. Uh, and we'll have plenty of David Combs stories, I'm sure, throughout the years. But for me, he was really like a, a just immediately, he was so smart and yeah. we just immediately bonded. So I loved school and I loved hanging out with Will. Um, yeah. It was, yeah. It, was, it, was, it, was, it felt very comfortable uh, automatically. It's it. But you're right, though. It, it wasn't Corey and Sean. That wasn't a thing no. yet. No. Um, right. You know, it, was, it wasn't until several episodes later, which we'll talk about where, you know, especially when Danielle joined the cast, where it was really like, oh, this is the show. Yeah. Like, that's, that's when real. that's when the whole thing kind of changed. And it was until then, it was us in those very strange clothes, um, <laughs> which which were just very I mean, I, that was one of the things that struck me as as were. You know, if we get back as we get back into the episode, so we're past the opening title sequence. Which sounds and the, the opening to me sounds like a uh, a a, a riot, like music you would hear in line at Disneyland. Yes, <laughs> just That's on a exactly loop. what, it, or or oh, you're in a carousel oh, oh, oh. just going around, and by the fifth time, you're like, "Stop that song!" Yes, <laughs> yeah. It's... And so this episode was written by Michael Jacobs and April Kelly. Does anyone remember April Kelly? I do. Yes, I do too. Okay, I remember, I remember yeah, her she's... little dog. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And her Ferrari. Remember, she'd always drive That's up right. in the Ferrari. That's right. I think I met, I think I, I do think I met April Kelly uh, early on. I do remember her. I remember what she looks like and I can picture an outfit. But then April Kelly just kind of disappeared. Yeah, she was she there the whole the sh- first season, wasn't she? First she was there season. the first yeah. season. Yeah. yeah. And then she left after the first season and uh, as far as I know, left the industry. Yeah. But her name is on every, every single episode. Every episode. Of she got paid for Girl Meets and, World. And, and she got yeah. paid for every single episode. Yeah. Okay. And then another Good thing day. I wanted to talk about is that this episode, this pilot episode was directed by John Tracy. But mm-hmm. then I'm pretty sure this is the only episode of season one John Tracy directed. No, he came back. He came he back. Did, in season maybe? one? Uh, maybe not in season no, one. No, couldn't right. have been. No, because season one was all David Trainer. David Trainer. Yeah, David Trainer. Yeah. 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 Um, and David Trainer is a legendary television director. John is too, but David is best known for he did every single episode of the, that 70s show. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I have some great David Trainer stories as we get into the season. But David, David was incredible. Uh, John, I remember just being very funny, thick Boston accent. Um, and he would he would yell and sort of shout and like tell everybody where to go. And, and his brother Kevin Tracy was also on the show um, yeah. as a camera coordinator, I believe. Yeah. Well, so, no. Yeah, at th- first, if you look at the pilot episode, because I noticed this, it says the first. It says he was the stage manager the first episode. Oh wow. Okay. Interesting. Which I w- yeah. he was by the time I had gotten there, he already wasn't. But I guess for that first episode, he was the stage manager. Interesting. So. Yeah. And so, does anyone know why John only directed the pilot and not anymore in that first season? Was there a story? there if there is do we not know it um i think i think that's pretty typical i think it's it was typical for somebody to direct the pilot and then move on because the goal as a director is to direct as many pilots as possible not Mm -hmm. to get stuck on a series because when you direct a pilot you make money residuals on every episode on every episode for the rest of that show's life so he didn't need to in a way (laughs) you know like uh but i don't remember if there was a reason that john did not come back but david trainer was truly a genius he he was like a classically trained shakespearean theater director and he really defined the tone and the and the look and the feel of the show so i think probably what happened is david trainer came on and they gave him the entire first season in his contract they said like he probably said if i'm coming to do your you know show and you want my talents, I have to do X many episodes, if not the whole season, like a certain guaranteed amount. And so that's probably what kicked in. And then they just had David Trainer, which was wonderful because he yeah. really set an incredible uh, environment for all of us. My, yes. In my head, he is he's seven feet tall. I mean, I remember yes. him being hugely, six foot seven, six foot hugely seven. tall. Yeah, was he really, six, seven, really? I think so. I mean, he was, I, so. he was, I mean, he was, yeah. He, and he's also skinny. very thin. Yeah, yeah. he's yeah. so thin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the way he walked across stage, he could like go that, you know, that cavernous stage with soundstage we talked about he could do the length of it in what felt like four strides yeah was it was amazing. yeah it was it was crazy and he uh, i'll never forget one feeling like such a dope because 
um, we were doing the first first episode, which turned out to be the second episode that's aired. Um, and uh, I said something like, well, you know how I did it in the audition and in front of everybody he's like, yeah, who cares how you did it in the audition? And I just remember being like, oh, man, like and he was never mean about it. He did it with a smile on his face. But it was like, oh, geez, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and do what I'm told. Right. Uh, so it was, um, it, it, it was such a strange environment to go because, again, it was just like. You, I didn't know any of any of 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 making television like this. None. This is not how we did any of the Nickelodeon stuff. So everyone just assumed I knew what I was doing, and then it's just kind of you're just going. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, it's so like David the show Trainer, started, and you're just going. That's it. David Trainer would have been the first person to teach us some of the basics of sitcom acting, which yeah. are you don't have a fourth wall, and you have to like like for instance, you always have to stand like if you're having a conversation with somebody, you have to stand with your shoulders open so the camera can see your entire face. So it's like if you notice, everybody on sitcoms kind of stands at like an awkward angle to each other, and it feels weird. We make it look normal because you right. get used to it as an actor, and you but as, you have to sort of force your body to do something that's not. Yeah. Natural. And normally, you're not turning though, you have to turn the right way. And yes. you have to, yeah, so you yeah. don't like you don't square 50-50 with people. You turn a slightly out, and then like, yeah, if you're gonna be talking to somebody over to your right, you gotta make sure you don't turn your head away from the camera. Like all these basic things that I, of course, if you're a seasoned theater actor like Bill Daniels, you just know. But for us, we had to be taught that. Like you have to tell yeah. kids, like, oh, it's it's not like you're really talking to this person, you're performing talking to this person. Here's the way to do that. You know, and I remember David Trainer was so good at all those little tricks yeah. and, he was and teaching us the stuff. basics of sitcom acting yeah so the first scene that we see after the cold open is and and then the intro we see Corey listening it's they're, they're performing romeo and juliet at the front of the class and Corey is listening to the phillies game yeah. um in this scene is the first time i really noticed the how loud the laughs were <laughs> and i couldn't tell if it was Mo if it, it or were those the sounds they collected from the live studio audience or was the laugh track just that loud? Because the laughs sound like they're in your ear. I, I've heard this about Boy Meets World before, like that, that it has an extremely loud laugh track compared yes. to most sitcoms. It I does. Think, it and does. I think that is true. You know, I mean, like, yeah, I think for whatever reason, I you know, maybe it's it maybe it was a creative choice or somewhere along the line the show just got cranked up because it is very loud and yeah i mean there i'm sure that there was uh, some adherence to the uh the the genuine laughter but there's also a machine making laughter sounds like well Michael it's also Jacobs they didn't was... know us the audience didn't know us yet so for the first few episodes i think it's mostly laugh track i think until yeah. we aired it was really mostly laugh yeah. track because then you get fans and then the fans come in yeah. but until then michael used to always he, he would always tell me that i'd say something or hey that joke didn't land that whatever and he'd always look at me and goes I, I, to this day i still can hear him in my in my head saying don't worry i have a machine that thinks you're hysterical <laughs> and so that's what he would say i have a machine yeah. that thinks you're hysterical and it's like okay well Get that's that's laughs hard can we talk very briefly about the girl who is lying on the on the desk? You touch me with, with that knife. With you you touch me, me the first that time. She was amazing. Yes. Yeah. Oh my and god. And why we... did we never see her again? Because uh, she was the best. Other than you, she was the best child actor of the lot. <laughs> yeah. She. We used to quote her for years. I mean, I remember Ben and I would say it to each other. You touch me with that knife. You better kill you me. Better the kill first me the first. Time. She was great. It's great. I know. Oh my god. I just remember. So I funny. literally wrote that down. I'm taking notes, and I'm like, why did she disappear? She was awesome. Well, like, I, it's just a revolving cast, those first few episodes, you know, yeah. like, and it's true. Like you want the thing about a, a show like this is you're when you're, you're, you know, and this is to Michael's credit, you don't want to make too many decisions ahead of time, especially when it comes to cast. You want it to be an ensemble. You need to see where there's chemistry. And I think that that right. is in part a physical thing, chemistry. Like you need to like, do these people just work together? Do they respond to one another? Do they make each other smile? Do, is there a twinkle in the eye when two people, it, sometimes it's just not there, you know, yeah. and sometimes yeah. like, and I think that they, you know, we kept keep trying these first four or five episodes. You're going to see this you know, some kids come in with two lines, one kid come in and then like somebody like Lee Norris can't comes in and it's just the dynamic clicks or when yeah. Danielle, when you came in, it was magical. Yeah. It, it just was worked. magical. Yeah, and it was yeah, like, yeah. Oh, and that was also the same episode where they finally fired the third best friend. And I remember David trainer, great director and so supportive. They gave me all of this guy's parts. So I showed up for work that day and my part went from like two lines to like 
five scenes and a whole bunch to work on. And I was so nervous. And David Trainer grabbed me and pulled me in front of the whole crew and say, can I just say, for the record, this is long overdue. Can everybody give Ryder a big round of applause? I remember He's that. going to do this this week and he deserves it. And everybody applauded the whole crew. And I remember just being like, okay, I got this. And yeah. you know, that was the episode that the show came together because I remember with the audience that week, and we'll talk about it when we get to it, but like they reacted so much to the Topanga character in contrast to the Corey character and in contrast to the Sean, it just all came together. That's when the and, show started. It, yeah, it, we had episodes started. before, but that is when the show started in my yeah. opinion. And it, because it, it wasn't just Corey and Topanga, but it was also Corey, Sean. I mean, yeah. that was, the show then evolved and became, we've talked about the two Boy Meets Worlds where then Eric kind of had his own thing going on. And, but the, 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 the three of you, especially that was the start. And that was, um, you know, you're right. It was kind of getting there, took a, took a few episodes, but, uh, once it did, then it was yeah. kind of off. To no, the this is clearly a show about a teacher and a student. And yeah, man, this episode, absolutely it's so and compelling. I cannot believe how compelling Bill Daniels was. He's um, so good. I, I mean, know. he's so good. Do you guys than- notice he's shaking his hands shaking? Really? Did I, did, I didn't notice it. I oh remember it. I remember no. it from when yes. I was a kid and yes. I remember seeing it, but I did not notice it in the episode. I, I noticed think it I in the episode because Ben and I were obsessed with it because of course we were scared kids and he was scary. He was this professional. Yeah. He was intimidating. Intimidating. And he had a professional manner. He would show up memorized. He was so old school. You know, we knew him from Knight Rider or whatever. We had like visions of this great actor. And on tape night, when the audience showed up, we could tell that he was nervous. Yeah. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was just shaking hands. I don't know. I mean, that happens to actors. But I remember Ben and I being obsessed with that and like whispering to each other, did you see his hands are shaking? And in some ways, I think it made us feel better because sure. it was like, oh, if this guy who is so scary to us, Mr. Feeney, if, if he's nervous, it's okay that we're nervous. You know, in yeah. fact, it's almost cooler that we're not shaking. Shaking. You know, we could sort of have this authority as kids, like, no, look at us. We're, we're cool with the audience. I remember that so distinctly. And it like just hit me like a lightning flash when I saw uh, Bill's hands shake. And I think it's in this, this scene because of the way he grabbed the radio. I could see his hands oh. shake. I was like, oh, that's right. I remember uh, just always watching that. Does anybody now that is one of the questions I had. Does anybody know how old Bill was when we started? Well, 93. The year was 93. He is right. now 90... 95. 95. So 29 okay. years, right? 20. I was an English major. This is yeah, not exactly. So Do let's the math, take 30 Danielle. from 95 would be 65 <laughs> and then add one, 66. How much of the pie do I get to eat is the question. <laughs> um, so, okay. All right. So, all right. He's already mid-60s. late 60s, mid, mid, mid 60s. Okay. By yeah. that he time. Looked good. He, looked he looked good. great. great. Yeah. By he the way, great. the <laughs> young girl playing Juliet is named Kristen Moore. She deserves her flowers. Yeah. She the, does. The young talent we we didn't get to see again. Her name is Kristen Moore. So she was phenomenal. She really was great. She had yeah. a couple lines. If you get if you get one line and you get a solid laugh on the one line you get, that's pretty impressive. Absolutely. Um, so that was great. So in this scene, Ben gets detention. We learn that Ben gets detention and then Corey gets detention. It's going to be really hard for us to go back and forth between <laughs> Ben and Corey. I, I, I will do it all the time. I'll try to correct myself when I do. What Corey, should we call them? Should, should we just listen, stick with character we can't, voices? We're never going to be able to we're do never it. Gonna yeah, I guess we're never gonna, we're gonna go in and out both I at the time. So Corey true. gets detention. He goes home and this is where we meet Eric Matthews. Right. Yes, we do. Well, first, can we just very quickly talk about how times have changed and they showed a knife fight in school, essentially? <laughs> I and mean, then doesn't it immediately cut to shooting? On the, oh no, that's later where he's shooting at the video. He's game. shooting at the video game, but <laughs> but it's it's somebody holding somebody else down on a desk, trying to stab him, and the yeah. principal comes over like, okay. I mean, it's like it's a different time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then we meet Eric Matthews. Oh, Eric Matthews. Yes. Yeah, you had a doubt on yourself, dude. You were great. No, no, it's, no, it's, no, I was not. Why do you think you're so? It was like, oh, because the 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 scene the scene at the end. So the first scene, it's not. It's very stiff obviously, and I have no idea what to do with my hands, and it's very awkward, <laughs> the first scene. But the second, the scene where I come back and I'm acting, and I'm like, newsflash, I'm not cool. It's the worst <gasps> thing ever. You, you're so hard on yourself. Like, sit, kids sitcom acting it wasn't much better overall. <laughs> like, yeah, like, but it was like, just uh, in the show. I mean, I remember it's literally li- like I finished it last night, and I was like, every single person in that show was better than me. Every single one. <laughs> I think you're just way too hard on yourself. Way because too hard. I got better. I don't get me wrong. I certainly got better. But that right. first episode, that was 
painful for me to watch. It was like, <laughs> I am acting now uh, and I have to stand. The only thing I'm missing is literally looking down for the T on the ground to where to put my feet because they get, they give you these little T marks to where yeah, you were just uncomfortable, dude, but it doesn't uh, really play that way. I'm no, sure you're, just, you're, you're projecting your discomfort. It, yeah. I, I don't know. But I just, also, that, like I said, the writers didn't know who Eric was. You were no. sort of a stock older brother. Generic character. older brother. You're so generic and it's all but, like dates and I want the girls I remember the, the only, game. the like, only what? time I was ever mentioned mentioned in a review at all at the very beginning so we did there was one table read we did where we had just aired it was the table read right after we first came out and michael read um uh, reviews in front of everybody oh i I, I remember the reviews the one he said (laughs) about bill daniels was was, you for 30 years oh no the one (laughs) about bill daniels was great he said uh, you know, Bill Daniels, uh, Mr. Comes as Mr. Feeney. And then the quote ended with a great actor stoops. <laughs> and I remember Bill putting his head in his hands and all which of us is, laughing. Which is and how the, Bill probably felt. Right? Yeah. He and has two this, Emmys for St. Elsewhere at this point. Yeah. And he's coming onto this kid's show. He must have felt, and a sitcom too. Like he had yeah. not done multi-camera sitcom. And like, you have to remember, this is hard for people to wrap their heads around these days. But back then you were either a TV actor or a or movie a film actor. actor. Yep. And if you were a, or a TV, stage actor, right, or a stage actor, of course. Yeah. But Bill was kind of all of those things, but TV was kind of the lowest tier. If you wanted, if you wanted to make no money, but do quality work, you were a theater actor. Exactly. If you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to be famous, the best was movie actors. And then for being a TV actor, especially a multi-camera sitcom actor. That's it, a sitcom uh, TV actor. And then a kids show sitcom TV actor. Oh my God, he was so It was like work in the drive-thru. Can I read you a review? Yeah. Oh God, please. Okay, so David Zurowick of the Baltimore Sun wrote, Oh, geez. Predicting Nielsen's success for Boy Meets World, dot, 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 is not a particularly daring or incisive call. It's mainly based on scheduling and stars. Then he continued, forget quality. These are kids we're programming for on Friday nights. Here's where you have to give ABC some credit for going an extra mile and adding William Daniels to the cast as Corey's nemesis, his sixth grade teacher, Mr. Feeney. The confrontation between the, hey, I'm just a kid, Corey, and the arch and starch Feeney makes this series something an adult doesn't have to feel ashamed of watching. Amazing. He ultimately gave it two and a half stars out of four, but said, I won't argue with anyone who wants to give it three stars. Okay, well, there's some that's better because I, I was going to say I think the only one I heard was the with that I was mentioned at all was the older brother is a cardboard cutout prop. That's the only one <laughs> I remember. Also, kind of correct. It's so <laughs> like, true. Your it character is, is just true. a stand-in for. Yeah, yeah. no, I, think I play that, the arc. You are archetypal older brother. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, we all are on, on in these early days, except for Ben and Bill. You know, which like, was a great were, dynamic. It it's was an amazing a dynamic. Great dynamic between yeah. the two of them. It really was. Yeah. But um, I just remember shooting in that bedroom scene, and if I'm, I could be wrong. I was thinking about this last night, but I think our beds constantly switch. Where it's oh, like, yeah. all right, it, just whatever yours? the episode was, it was like, now that's Corey's bed. Well, now that's Eric's bed. Now that's Corey's bed. Now that's right. Eric's bed. <laughs> um, and it just kind of went back and forth uh, over and over. And it was always like entrances and exits, man. Like, Eric, walk into room. Do not move hands. Say Corey line. Walk out of room. It all was right, can just. We, can, can we get to scene three now? <laughs> can we please? <laughs> we please. So scene three. <laughs> Go. We go downstairs. We've got the parents. Uh, yep. Yeah, we meet the family for the first time. Yeah, we finally meet the, the, the family. And uh, a full house reference? Yes! It of was course, so it's ABC. self-referential. Yeah. So, so already it's ABC. self-referential. Of course. I thought we didn't do that to like season five. But no, no. it's really funny that, uh, yeah, it was like, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. And you Lily had to. A, Lily was, well, Lily, I remember Lily as. So cute kind of being yeah. like, geez, it's weird. She's just spouting the lines and it's not, to me, it was like, oh, it's not really work. When you watch it, she's adorable she's and so hitting cute. some pretty great beats. What was yeah. the line at the end where she said, where she says, I'm, you, I remember, I don't even remember because I wasn't there for the pilot, obviously. Uh, so I don't remember ever hearing Lily say it, but I remember that she, one of the things she says, a line she says during the tea party with mm-hmm. Ben at the end, yeah. you guys all quoted, you repeated the way she said it all the time. And I think I wrote it Yeah, down. what was that? Which one? Oh my gosh, I'm going to need to find it. But it was like, 
I'm I'm not telling. It, yeah. there was, she had some reading during that line. Gosh, I wish I wrote it down. But I I hear Ben and Ryder saying it. We used to make fun of her for it. Oh my yes, god, because it was some. You, yeah. Well, you know, it's so funny. What you, like I totally remember what you were saying, Will. About there was the same because when you're, it's hard to remember that when you're a kid, a lot of what you do is compare yourself to other kids. Sure. And, and especially younger ones, and you're so proud of yourself for not being that dumb younger kid and i remember comparing myself to lily and thinking well she's not a real actor what is she do? but she's like five or and she's six, good and she's amazing <laughs> she's and i was good. like but i remember being so smug and i think that was part of being 12 or i was 13 so ben was only 12 and i think it was part of our like well at least we're not just like you know because it was hard you it's hard to get a six-year-old to say lines and to stand to in the right place and have anything right i mean I, look i have a seven-year-old i know and like so the idea that she was able to deliver what she was doing is incredible but at the time i was just so proud of myself for being like well i know how to read and sit, hit my marks and i, I know how to really I act know how to read isn't that ridiculous <laughs> but that's what you do when you're a kid you're just so proud of like not Way being to go, eight. six year old yeah. exactly yeah, no. <laughs> no she was but that's the thing i look back at that now she was exactly what she was supposed to be she yeah, was she's adorable wonderful. she was hitting cute... the lines and she was a great foil uh to, to ben and the, the, the scenes where she just all of a sudden where she grab we'll get into it but where she grabs the doll and throws it and then just off offers him the chair. All that stuff is great. Yeah. yeah I mean, so, and I, I think this is a really great opening scene too for Betsy and Rusty, Amy and Alan. Talk about two like wonderful parent characters. Like yeah. just right off the bat, they have a great dynamic. You feel the love in this family. You just want to be part yeah. of the family. Yes. It's yeah, you immediate. Do. It's yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's so comforting. It's so yep. welcoming. And yet it still has that level of irony, right? Like self-awareness. That's that's like the the sort of boy meets world Michael Jacobs magic is that, yep. you know, it, it does the predictable thing, the very sweet loving, but then everybody's just a, just sarcastic and ironic enough, just like yep. yeah. singing each other enough, you know, and like, especially um, Rusty as the dad is just, you know, when, when, it, when you come for the this big like Corey moment where he later where he's like dad I left you and like the the way that Rusty just kind of plays it off like I'm cool man it's good yeah, you know, yeah. Like, that's fine yeah, yeah. There's, it's perfect circle of life yeah. they did but it's also it's such a typical thing in in sitcoms about kids and it was done here too but it was done in a much I thought a, a better way better written way at the end of the day it just comes down to the writing there's there's always the sense of someday you'll you'll understand kid like yeah. you get that in every show someday you'll understand kid but it didn't come off like that with this episode it was it was like it wasn't other people telling. I mean, even though it was, it was Corey well, finding it out himself. With Feeny. It's personalized yes. with Feeny. Like it becomes this journey with me, and that's like we'll get into it. But when you see Feeny get ditched on his dinner, it's like, oh, he's humanized, and he, yeah, you know, he's no. And, and for Corey to have, it's a, it's exactly played out. So the like, you'll know when you're older is played out in story. And it, right, and that's what I mean. Characters. So it's not that kind yeah. of sitting him down. No. You'll figure this out when you're older. Can we eventually talk about Feeny just making a salad? We'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so in this scene, though, this is this is the scene where we find out that the family already knows that Corey has detention. And yeah. he's like, how do you possibly already know that? And now we find out as the audience, yes. oh, he stuck his head over the side of the fence and told me. And you learn as the audience. And by the way, that's all they say. It's not made a big deal about like, right. oh, drats, the teacher lives next door. It's just that's it. The audience learns, oh. Feeney stuck his head over the fence. He lives next door. So that's Feeney obviously- lives to the side of us on the side fence. That's what we learn right from there, which is oh pretty amazing. Oh my God, we're gonna Their keep backyards back How can it, to who, each who, other. Who, 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 when, when, did, do, who it's directly who, opposite the front door. You go into the front door the on back. the left side, you okay. go through to the kitchen, and then okay. you go into the backyard. Okay. It's, then they're not neighbors. <laughs> he lives they, they lives behind them. Oh, oh, that's still a bro. neighbor, my friend. I guess. <laughs> All right, can I we get the same four? How many okay. scenes do we have? So Ten then we go scenes? back to school. We we learn about detention. We go back to right. school. Now, this scene I thought was a little was really interesting. So I thought it was going to, again, watching it for the first time in 29 years, maybe. Maybe the first time ever. I don't have a memory of it. Uh, I thought when Corey says to Sean, hey, should we go to the game on Friday? Let's go. And Sean says, well, what about detention? And he's like, ah, don't worry about that. In my head, I thought, oh, now the rest of the episode's going to be he ditches detention. They come up with a scheme to go get tickets. No. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah no. None of that. Because they weren't Corey and Sean yet. No, we no. I was just a... But- 
And uh, also, uh, the first first forgotten uh, sibling is reference. I talk. I make a joke about uh, Cor- uh, um, Chauncey's character being an only child. Yeah, I, like he's lucky to be an only child because he has uh, bought the hot lunch or I don't know what or he brings. I don't know, but I yeah. but I was like immediately like, wait, so Sean was already established as not an only child, which then gets completely forgotten as the seasons go on. Right. Yeah. Right. So you you didn't like your lunch because you must have been, I'm assuming, the second child. Yeah. So second child problems, you get forgotten because right. there are too many other things to think about. And Chauncey right. has a delicious lunch because he's an only child. Right. Um. But yeah, just the opposite of girl. I'm sorry. I always wanted to buy my lunch. Like if if somebody made you lunch that like you wanted to buy lunch at school, didn't you? That's a whole different thing. I'm just I'm just (laughs) that's it was a weird joke to me because I was like, I would rather have bought lunch at school than have the sandwich that my mom was going to make. I thought like I thought. Yeah, but I don't know. I think that's a class distinction that's different in cities than suburbs. Maybe I guess maybe. I think if yeah, I think if you're in the city, your your parents just pay the cheap lunch or you get the free lunch. And then if you have really loving parents, they like make you your lunch but it like where oh, i grew up so too it's it was like the fact that i had a bag lunch economic which joke. my like vegetarian crappy was like such a source of shape oh man yeah <laughs> if no, i had I been able wanted... to get the hot pizza lunch at the exactly or like the, the hot dogs or i would have been a rich or... kid man no exactly yeah. god anyway <laughs> oh something shiny um yeah so that that whole but but Danielle talked about this at the very beginning about continuity for our show. Oh, our show is disastrous. And it was just all over the place all the time of who had siblings, who didn't have siblings, where did you live, who did you live with, all this stuff. Ryder had a very good point. To Michael's credit, you don't really want to get attached to anything. And if in sitcom land, if something is funny, that is king, whatever is funny. Sure. And yeah. so if it made sense to have a joke that Ryder is is not as well taken joke. care of because he's got siblings, make that joke. And yep. if five episodes from now, we want to say that Ryder's an only child, we'll do that too. Yeah. Well, and that's, like, who that's, cares? I mean, that's the evolution of Sean too, because like, you know, I took over for some other actor and they gave me a sister for that episode. Then they forgot about it. And then it was really just like one trailer park joke that established that Sean lived at a trailer park. And I will find it. I can't wait to see it. Because I yeah. remember it was just like an offline, or it was just an offhand, like one line joke that then became this like recurring joke that then became... The drama, the central drama of Sean's life is that he's so poor and that his parents have abandoned him at different times and that he, you know, complicated. You know, that we ended up developing this entire history out of yeah. what really started as a make fun of the poor kid joke at some point, you know, and I, I can't wait to see it. All right, let's go to the treehouse. Scene four. Yes. Yes, I don't so think I ever. The, the one thing that went through my head is I don't think I ever got to do a single scene in that treehouse. No, I, I don't. I don't think I did really either. We it wasn't really, very big. No. But by the well, way, we don't use treehouses enough on shows. It was beautiful. So yeah. Cool. Really cool. Really, really cool. Really, really yeah. cool. Really different for a set. Like I thought it looked great. I, I just was like, why don't? Why is there not another one of these? Yeah. So I watched this episode with my son. Um, and uh, maybe now is a good time. I, I recorded a conversation with him before and after. And the reason I bring it up is because I think I, I didn't get this on tape when we 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 talked on uh, with my microphone. But uh, he was blown away by the idea that everything was shot inside. When I told him that, like, even when we were in the treehouse, that's on a stage. We are inside. And he could not get over that. That was like the most <laughs> shocking thing that ever happened. He's like, wait, so you never went? And I was like, no, dude, that's the way you should film a TV show. It's everything inside. And this scene was especially confounding because you're outside in the treehouse. Yeah. And I guess like maybe we assume everybody knows that, but probably not, especially not kids. Right. When they watch a show, they believe in the reality of it's outdoors. Um, but yeah, so, so Ryder, I had a discussion. Indy has never seen an episode of Boy Meets World, right? Not completely true. He had watched okay. one episode after we had done a, a, a taping. We did one of these charity rewatches uh, last year. And so it was queued up on Disney Plus. So the next time he turned on Disney Plus, there was an episode. He was like, let's watch your show. And we did. And it's from like fifth season. I have it. I had no recollection of it. And he thought <laughs> it was so weird and he never wanted to do it again. But now he's been watching sitcoms. He's been watching multi-camera shows. And I realized it's kind of appropriate for him to watch it. And so I sat down with Indy. I asked him a little bit uh, before we started. And then we talked a little after. Um, and so I, I, I put it together in a couple minutes. Um, and it, this is a clip I am calling Too Much Shirts. Great. What do you think the show's about? A dude. Yeah. What are your favorite TV shows right now? I don't really have like a favorite right now. Okay. Nikki, Ricky, 
Dicky and Tricky and Dawn? What the heck? <laughs> What's it called? Nikki, Ricky, Dicky, and Dawn. And I already finished all of them. Yeah, you finished all of them. What about Thundermans? Did you finish the Thundermans? Yes. Right. But I mostly watch Diary of Wimpy Kid. Yeah, Diary of Wimpy Kid's a big hit. Well, I think maybe that's a good indication that you'll like this show. But I haven't seen it for 30 years, so I don't know how I'm going to feel about it. What do you think I'm going to look like? Handsome. Oh, thanks, man. No freckles. Yeah, I don't think I had freckles by that time. I had freckles when I was your age, but they were gone by the time I started the show. Your skin was shiny. <laughs> makeup. Well, you had makeup? Of course. Yeah, you always wear okay, makeup. Okay, get you're... back to you and let's watch it. Okay. Uh, Any initial thoughts, Indy? It was good. Really? Mm-hmm. You didn't laugh. I never do that to any of them. Oh, okay. What was good about it? I don't know. I just like you in it. Oh, yeah? Sorry, was your favorite part? Yes. I had a small part, though. I didn't really do much. You did a lot. Uh, What did I do? You just said hi. And you were at the same spot every time you talked. Oh, in the cafeteria? You never, like, got up. Well, I was in the classroom, too. I was sitting Yeah, but you were always sitting. Yeah. Whenever you talk to you a sitting. That's true. I don't think I stand in the entire pilot. I thought I sounded weird. My voice sounded like shaky to me. I liked it. All right. What did you think of uh, the storyline with, with Corey? Who's he? He's the main kid. Okay. <laughs> it was all about him. What are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> you saw me. I'm just sitting there. I was there. too focused on you, oh. so I said it was only about you. No. Come on. What about the teacher? What did you think of him? He was weird. Why? Because he had a mustache. Do you think he's a good teacher? No. Why not? He's mean. Oh, you thought he was mean, huh? Yeah. Oh. Well, what about the parents? Did you think they were good parents? Yeah, but he didn't like the dad. He was cheesy. Cheesy? What way? He was just like... (laughs) What about about Will? What about Will as the older brother? How was he? Meany. You thought he was mean too? Did, did it look like Will looks now? No. Yeah, it doesn't look anything like him? Only his hair. All right, what did you think of our clothes and stuff? Too much shirts. Long shirts. Yeah. They were really big, weren't they? Mm-hmm. Does it seem, like, old-fashioned? No. Really? Did it feel like, like that's what it's like to be a kid these days, too? Yeah. Cool. Well, do you do you think you'd want to watch any more? Sure. Yeah, and I have to say he has been begging to watch it every, wow. every day since. Wow, Feeny's <laughs> Mean. Interesting that well, he picked up the Feeny's Mean kind of well, thing. He did, because Feeny is, actually. He is. Like, I was he amazed is. at how strict he is and how like authoritarian. And But yeah, it was so funny to realize that, that my son was really seeing it through Corey's eyes. And actually, the, the fact that he didn't even recognize, like he didn't even know Corey's name, I think is an indicator that he just saw Ben as a sort of avatar. Do you know what I mean? He put himself in Ben's shoes. Like he he thought the brother was mean, the teacher was mean, because yeah. that's how Corey sees the world, right? Like that's how it starts. And he didn't, you know, he, he he's seven. So he's still kind of in the zone where I think if he's introduced to a character and they're like, Mr. Matthews, get out of my face, which is like what Feeney says to him. He's like, he's not going to get come back from that very easily. Now, I have a question. Was he right? Did you not stand throughout the entire episode? I think so. Yeah. After he said that, I was like, I don't, I'm only sitting in the cafeteria and sitting in the classroom. So, yeah. And I think it's like that for the first season (laughs) until, until the Corey's Alternative Friends episodes. I'm always just like, you know, I mean, in a weird way, I was sort of like this. What are the characters in the Muppets where they're on the, the, the boxes? Oh, the, Ad, yeah, they're the, watching the... Waldorf, yeah, Statler, the, and Waldorf. The, yeah, I, I was kind of like that, right? Like, I was just Corey's, like, sidekick in the cafeteria while yeah. we eat. Because I just remember always having to eat and act the worst. <laughs> You're good at it, though. You're a well, good You are. You're a great actor. No, I'm yeah. not, actor because eater, I eat yeah. too much. I actually ate. If you watch Bill Daniels, he just, like, pushes stuff around on his plate. That's That's smart. an actor thing. That's an actor That's thing. Smart. You see that in yes. every show. I literally watched it last night in M.A.S.H., where yeah. all the characters are pushing around the food. That is like a big actor thing. You just use, you move your fork, but you don't yep. actually eat. So smart. And so you're just smart. chowing down food. I'm remember, actually eating. Do you remember like Michael find... rationalized that once, why you were doing that? Is because you were poor and it's the only place you got food. And you're like, that sounds like a rationalization. He's like, yeah, I just made that up. Yeah, totally.
I, I find a moment where I don't have to speak for a while and then take a bite there so that mm -hmm. in the background somewhere people see that I am eating. It makes you nice. think that I must be eating the rest of the time, but then that's the only time I really nice. eat. <laughs> but I'm not in the pilot, so what do I know? <laughs> it, um, depended, it depended on the episode and how fat I was. Towards the end where I was very, very fat, I'd eat whatever they put in front of me. But speaking uh, of so eating, different. so Feeney serves himself a salad, which yes, is his entire dinner salad, for two people. A salad for two, which I is what he made. by the way, it was the starter. I think he had a multiple course meal. No, I because would later so. they referenced salad, salad, salad for two. Yeah. Salad yeah. for two. Yeah. No, I and guess by the right. way, it just greens. Be. There was nothing else in the salad. He didn't uh. even slice a tomato, the man. For or, I mean, it was like, help us Our out budget was tight, guys. We couldn't I, spring for a I'm steak. I'm pretty sure it was supposed to imply that he had a full meal planned. I think so too. And I it was a, so. it was the starter. Now, I um, have a question. Have we, has, has, has I, I know it was obviously the pilot, so it's the first time, but was that angle into Feeney's house ever used again? No. Mm -mm. Never. No, we never I saw that so. again, kind of peeking into Feeney's home. No, there's a scene later where I think Ben and him sit outside of Feeney's home and have tea together or and talk uh, coming up. Uh, and But those were even very few and far between. Most yeah. of you were went into in the, the house yard. once when it became the with the lit the loo to see how licked it is. I mean, you guys are in the ah, house once. The B&B right? B &B B &B episode. episode. Yeah, yes, we'll get into the that. That's the one time we got to see inside Feeney's house is when uh, Corey and I turned his house into a B&B. &B. And I remember right. it was really exciting to finally be here. And it suddenly had two stories, which doesn't, I don't think makes sense based on the outside, but yes. But um, that is, that's the only time we actually saw that, saw that angle, angle from into the, you know, into Feeney's home was just that time yeah. of the pilot. Okay, I was curious about yeah, that. Yeah, I don't think we'd ever one. seen that again. And I thought that looked really great too. We have mm -hmm. another, uh, he, Corey makes a comment in this treehouse scene about America's funniest home teacher. Yes, and I was right. like, wow, in this scene, in this episode, we have a full house reference and an America's funniest home video. ABC references, right? Yep. You yeah. Know? He did, the only thing he didn't do was turn to the camera and go, watch us on ABC Friday at 8 30. I mean, it was like they they did. They threw it in where they could. Well, if you That's keep it in the family, that makes sense. So That's this funny. is the scene where we all of a sudden our heartstrings pull for Feeney and we realize that he has right. been stood up and that he is a little heartbroken about it. And now yeah. we've humanized this um very teacher. stern teacher. Um, and yeah, then the next scene we're in with uh, with Betsy and and well, I guess ben. Amy and Corey yeah. uh, in the bedroom, and this is where she tells him that they're bringing in a a renter to it's to a rent sweet little the, scene. It okay, is. But, it's but so did sweet. you guys will did you notice the thing? What's the what's the switching of the beds? No, no, no. What, what? But Ben used to always say we never. Oh, Holcomb! I wrote Holcomb. it down. Holcomb! He I wrote says it down. Holcomb. Not only that, but it's also the the duck hunt gun has yes. no cord in one scene, and then the next scene has a cord and is plugged Wait, in. Wait, so what's Holcomb? So Ben could not say how come. How come? So whenever they wrote the line "How come" for the Holcomb. first season, he goes Holcomb. Holcomb. <laughs> really? And we, would always and say we that. used to tease him so much. Be like about Holcomb, it. you say it like that, Ben. The second. <laughs> <laughs> he used to always bug. I literally like, so, wrote that down. I wrote it down that's why I wrote down. Like, the second I heard it, it was like all the memories came flashing back of you just being like, Ben Holcomb, you say <laughs> I wrote it. H O C O M E. Holcomb. Oh my God. Yeah, that so was bad. Oh, that so... and, the, and the belt pulling, which must have come later. He did this like kind of always grabbing at his belt to pull up his pants. <laughs> that plus Holcomb. Yep. Oh my God. Oh my yeah. gosh, Holcomb. it's yeah, so let's keep cute. It, so, we'll keep a Holcomb tally going to see how many in the first season. <laughs> I didn't get. notice it, and uh, I, now, yep. now I'm going to pay attention to Holcomb, it. Okay. Yep. one. Uh, so we learned that, you know, Corey once abandoned his dad as he got a little older. Right. Great um, twist, great twist, emotional. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Get, adding in another layer makes Corey think. Uh, and then we get into the next scene, which is the detention scene, which to <sighs> me is just of every scene in this show was such a standout because of Bill Daniels. I yeah. yeah. I what and um, what luck that we had Bill Daniels. Oh, I, I, it, seriously. I mean, not only that, because we also know that there was for a while we weren't going to have him and he was going to leave. And the Let's fact that he's that for stayed. Bill to tell us, I exactly. can't wait to hear that from Bill. Exactly. I, I want to know that story, but he is Same. so compelling. Now, did yeah. anyone else have a problem? And I get why they did it. I totally get why they did it. And it was necessary to do it. But the fact that he's such a stern teacher and there's nobody else in detention. Yeah. Nah. Again, I got why they did it. They wanted the scene just be between Feeney and Corey. I totally understand yeah. that, and that's what it needed to be. But I found it, it's to me, it was like there's no, the, the entire school, there's nobody else in detention but Corey. 
Oh, you know what's funny? I didn't think about it as being that this is the detention for the entire school. It was yeah, just his was class. Just Feeney's class. It's okay. Just for Feeney's class or I'll classes, buy that. Uh, I'll buy and that, that there were other teachers running other detentions in the yeah. school. That's I'll where my, that. I didn't this think about it as okay. such a she, spectacular scene. It's amazing. amazing. You know, the real risk of this scene is that there's not a laugh for you know five minutes straight, and and that you know you're going to dip into sentimentality, which I think Boy Meets World did. Very often, but yeah. I couldn't believe how um, how serious it was and how willing it was to become a drama show, essentially, for an, an extended scene between two characters. And man, like I that, like like I said when we started, I could not believe how much of Boy Meets World was already encoded in this episode. And I think mm -hmm. it's because of this scene. I mean, they must have just knew they nailed it when they shot this scene, and you could see it and be like, oh, this is. I, I want to endlessly watch these people change each other, you know? Well, Bill doesn't speak another. at the beginning. That's the amazing yeah. part about it is He's Bill doesn't speak. For so long. You know, yeah. ben, ben is doing his kind of shtick yeah. and and Bill is doing everything while staring down at the page and it still works. It's well, so compelling. The Ben shtick is actually one of my favorite parts because Me too. as Ryder mentioned at the very opening of the show, Corey's character is a little bratty and you're a little bit like, hmm, is this a likable kid? And one of the things I loved is that you see him push the button and keep pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope. And then even though he's out the door, he comes back in like, I can't, I'm never going to leave. Like yeah. you and I both know I'm you're in control. I'm yeah. still ultimately a good kid. And that's, yeah, I know you're right. You, yeah. yeah. And you did. And you didn't even need to say it. You, you yeah. saw it. You knew it. You now already love and know this kid is a good kid. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I loved it. I love that beginning part. And then when Feeney finds out that Corey was spying on him or that had seen him and that he was stood up, the change, mm -hmm. the sternness with which Bill does that scene, it, I mean, it was just so compelling. I was absolutely eyes glued to the TV. Yeah. But also a perfect teacher where he uses it. He turned it into a teachable moment. I'm going to mm -hmm. take this moment and I'm going to teach what I tried to teach you with Romeo and Juliet. I'm now going to teach you right here because of this. And it was, yeah. it's such a great turn. And it's such, it's, it's, it just shows such depth of the Feeney character, which is, wow, you spied on me. You think this happened in my life. I'm not going to explain what happened in my life. I'm going to use this to teach you about something. And it was yeah. just, it That's set the stage for every, every other teachable Feeney moment that you still have, which is another question we always get, which is what what moment, you know, what did you learn from Bill or what did you learn from Feeney? And it was always moments like this where it's that teachable moment. It was incredible. Just One of amazing. my favorite uh, lines, ironically, is when he says, during Bill's um, monologue moment, he says, you come and you go, uh, you come into my class and then you leave me. And, you know, he's basically saying, like, I only get you for one year, which turns out to not be the case <laughs> when you have a television show. But, yeah, he says, you know, the time spent with me, I don't know if you learn anything or not. And it's like, if only we could tell him, like, yeah, you're going to be there for seven years. You're going to be going to college with these kids. Yeah, yeah. But he's also he's talking about I mean, he's we're at the end of the day, you have to remember, we're doing a kid show which is what TGIF was and what this was specifically geared toward. And one of the main characters is talking about Shakespeare and Chaucer and some of the greatest poets Emily and writers Dickinson. of all time. And using that as a teachable, it was, again, the idea of the teachable moment coming from a teacher, which is something that the joy that Boy Meets World could do, as opposed to, I learned the lesson from my dad, I learned the lesson from my mom. It's just kind of, you'd seen it before, or the teacher was a buffoon. Yeah. So the teacher teaching is just such a wonderful thing to watch all the, all the time. So yeah, that was, yeah. I'm like you, Danielle. I just, I couldn't move my eyes away from yeah, that scene. It was incredible. Scene. Amazing. So great. Amazing. Okay. So then Corey goes back to the house and he apologizes to his dad for ditching him. And Ryder, you mentioned it briefly earlier, but the, the, um, how casual Rusty is about, yeah. oh, what you know? No, that's cool. I, I, yeah. I get it. It's the circle of life. Um, he's just, you he just, what a, He's such a cool dad. Yeah, yeah, he was. Which is why I, I think my son called him cheesy. 
because he was trying cheesy, to, right. because he's probably taking a dig at me in that moment. Like, Dad, you try and be cheesy. You try and be cool like that all the time. And I fail. No. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> I love this scene. I, I love how Rusty is so um, relaxed and, like, not precious about anything, as Rusty always is. Such an yeah. amazing actor. And then Lily, so good. Like, Lily's just know. wonderful. And there's such a cute scene. You can see Corey finally changing, right? Like, yeah. he's doing the things now. He's talking to his dad. He's hanging out with his sister. It's a, it's a really great little scene. I thought, well, I'm not a huge fan of, of, of runners. I get that not all runners are good. But I wish that the no, don't hug me was a thing that kept going. I thought yeah. that was a great moment, and I thought that was one that could have come back later yeah, in the show. I think it ever did, right? Uh, no, I think that's the only time it happened, and I think it was great. So, yeah. Yeah, well, the next scene we have uh, Corey and Eric get to resolve their little conflict. Corey encourages Eric to call um, his date, Heather, um, and which I think is really sweet. Uh, it's a I nice little wrap up that now he he wants his brother to be happy. He wants him to have that. Even if it means pain for himself, he wants his brother to be happy. And then he goes downstairs and he has tea with his little sister. Yep. And um, it's great just, scene. It is so cute when she tosses the doll. I love that. I thought that was such a wonderful moment where she just t- tosses the doll. It's like the doll, because if you go back in, in the entire episode, a lot of scenes, she's cradling it like a baby and feeding it. And it's the most important thing to her. Corey, do you want it up there to keep you safe? And the second she gets a chance to be with her brother, she discards it. And here's yeah. the chair for you. It was so great. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I I love it. It's a very cute scene between the two of them. And then we learn in the tag, I thought this was very funny, that in the tag we learn, oh, you thought Mr. Feeney was stood up? Absolutely not. He's not a loser. You know he, nothing. You know <laughs> nothing at all. It wasn't a date. It was his sister. That's right. Uh, I thought that was a really He was going to travel little... a very long way for a really light meal. <laughs> um, just, just for the, it's like, hey, just George, I drove six hours. Could you have thrown some chicken in this? Like, thanks. <laughs> Please. Uh, just greens. <laughs> something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was just, it, uh, it's very, it's funny to me that like, he, that they could, they didn't want to leave it that he did actually get stood up. They wanted to yeah. clarify he didn't. Yeah. Well, I think it was also, it, it was also kind of clarifying that at 11, what you, you know think nothing. you know, you don't really know. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, it you brings know. us back to where Corey started, which is yeah. like he knows nothing. He knows and nothing. You yeah. got to come back next week to see him learn again something else about, yeah. And we'll the, all the learn together. Him. Yeah, yes. Well, speaking of which, we will be back next week. We will be watching the next episode, which is season one, episode two. It's called On the Fence. And um, yeah, I'm I'm excited to see it. I, I feel like I was very interested in the pilot. I thought the pilot was way better than I was expecting it to Me be. Me too. Me too. Uh, and so I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to see what this next episode was, which we've learned in this episode, Will, that is actually the first episode you guys all taped together. together. I think so, so. Yeah, I think this yeah. was the one. So awesome. I'm excited to excited to watch that. And uh, yeah, you guys have any closing thoughts? I, I think we I think just saying it was a lot better than I remember it being. And I'm glad it was. It was. Uh, yeah, it was a great episode. And man, Bill Daniels can act. That's yeah. what Boy, that's what I took ever. away from this. Completely agree. Will sign us off. We love you all. Pod dismissed. Pod Meets World is an iHeart podcast produced and hosted by Danielle Fischel, Will Friedell, and Ryder Strong. Executive producers Jensen Karp and Amy Sugarman. Executive in charge of production, Danielle Romo. Producer and editor, Tara Sudbach. Producer, Lorraine Guerrez. Engineer and Boy Meets World superfan, Easton Allen. Our theme song is by Kyle Morton of Typhoon. Follow us on Instagram at Pod Meets World Show or email us at podmeetsworldshow at gmail.com. 